Good morning, everybody. How's it going? You're looking good today. Glad to see you. Welcome. We're really glad that you're here. You look like you're ready to worship God, which is what we're here and all about. Um, for those of you joining us online, thank you for being here. We hope that you enjoy this time of worship and that you can really get involved in the worship and um, be united in the spirit with us. Um, for those of you that are here, make sure you sign in on the attendance pads and pass those down the row so that everybody can get signed in. Um, a couple of announcements. I wanted to let you know that choir begins this week on Tuesday nights at 730. If you're wanting to join the choir, we would love to have you make a joyful noise with us. Yeah, all of you, I'm, point, looking at, I'm looking at all of your faces. I've heard you sing. You sound great, so come on and join us. Um, if you want to sign up at the Connection Center, let us know that you're thinking about it. Um, that would be great. Also, maybe you noticed that the handbells are out and about in the foyer and in the library. They are also getting ready to start on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. They do their rehearsals up here. And that's a really fun way to worship God, too, is offering your, your gifts and talents to handbells. Now, the cool thing is with handbells is they'll teach you everything you need to know. You don't have to come with previous knowledge. You don't have to be able to carry a tune. <laughs> That's pretty good, right? So you can join the handbells, and they would love to have you and teach you and be a part of a great ministry. So if you're interested, stop by and visit with them, and they can get you started. I um, also wanted to let you know there's a table in the foyer that is for Emmaus. Um, Emmaus is an activity that we used to have a lot more going on, and we're starting back with um, honoring our Emmaus walk pilgrims um, with our lanyards that we ha get when you go on a walk. If you, are, if you have been on a walk to Emmaus, what they're wanting is for you to let them know that you've been on a walk. Give them your information so that we can start the contact list, right? If you have not been on a walk to Emmaus, we invite you to be on one, a walk to Emmaus. It's a really great opportunity to um, up your spiritual uh, walk. And so if you want information about that, you can stop by the table out front as well, and they can tell you all about going on a walk to Emmaus. It's, it's, it's a bit of a mystery, but it's a lot of fun, so just go check it out. <clears throat> Lastly, I wanted to remind you that um, Pastor Bob is doing a Bible study on Wednesday starting on the 13th of September. If you want to be a part of that, please do sign up at the Connection Center so that we can make sure we have enough materials for everyone to join in because we have to get books and video supplies and that kind of thing. So sign up and be a part of that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Now, today's scripture is from Psalm 138. It's awesome, so hear the word of God. I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will sing your praise before the heavenly beings. I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for you are constant for your constant love and truth. You have exalted your name and your promises above everything else. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased strength within me. All the kings on earth will give you thanks, Lord, when they hear what you have promised. They will sing of the Lord's ways, for the Lord's glory is great. Though the Lord is exalted, he takes note of the humble, but he knows the haughty from a distance. If I walk into the thick of danger, you will preserve my life from the anger of my enemies. You will extend your hand. Your right hand will save me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me, Lord. Your faithful love endures forever. Do not abandon the work of your hands. Thanks be to God. Let's worship. All right, a lot going on. Why don't y'all stand and let's worship together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is 
God's people said, amen. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my day. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hopes and make the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take
seated. We're going to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this day when we can come and spend time in your presence. Thank you for your love for us, that like a perfect father, you never, you never separate yourself from us. You're always present. Father, thank you for your kindness and your mercy and your graciousness. More than anything else, thank you for Jesus, the word made flesh. I pray this all in Jesus' holy, holy name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Now you can stand up and greet the people that you're worshiping with. So try to find someone you've never met before. And, uh, yeah. Okay, I think we need to, yes. Uh, someone's already calling it, Bah Humbug. Enough of this friendly stuff, I know you mean it, but if, if we don't find our seats, it'll be three o'clock before I'm done preaching. If you do find your seats, you'll, it'll be 2.30 when I'm done. By the way, can I just make a quick note? Um, we've got three plates up here, and these two are for offering and this one is for prayer requests. And I know it's a small thing. I, I had to take a prayer request out of the offering plate. If any of you saw it, I, I felt funny doing that. But remember, this is prayer requests here. Ah, oh, wonderful, yes. And by the way, if we could somehow mark that one and make it different, because I think it gets forgotten sometimes. Anyway, it, it's good to see you here on this um, holiday weekend. Let's go to God in prayer now. Heavenly Father, we come into your house today, and we thank you for all of your many blessings. We thank you for the very gift of life, for all the things we have that we take for granted, for all the things we should thank you for that we forget to thank you for, and yet, Lord, your, your blessings and your mercies are, are new each day. Lord, we just thank you for everything. And we pray that you would give us grateful hearts, that even as the world so often seems messed up, we would not, we would not forget that you are with us. And as we ask as we pray, in each of our lives we believe, we sometimes struggle to believe, we sometimes get things wrong, we sometimes make mistakes, we sometimes let ourselves walk in the darkness. We ask, though, that wherever we are today, that you would meet us and that you would bring us closer to yourself. Where we have questions, speak to us through your word and your spirit and help us to find truth. Where we have wounds, we pray that the, in your mercy, that the, the Holy Spirit would touch our lives and make us whole. Where we have gone on wrong paths, we pray that in your grace, you would call us to return. Where we are not certain of what we should do, we pray that you would show us what you want us to do in this present day. Where we do not know you yet, we pray that you would help us to know Christ. And we pray these things not only for ourselves, Lord, but we, we also pray that your blessing would be upon our families, our friends, the people we work with, the people we go to school with, our neighbors, the people that we like, and the people that we need you to help us to like more. 
We just pray that you would work, Lord, in all their lives and bless them and help us, Lord, to be part of that blessing. And finally, Lord, we want to lift up the names, the requests that were given today. We pray for George Caps, who is having health issues. Whatever they are, we pray that your healing hand would be upon them. We pray for Becky Bromley, who's having heart surgery on Tuesday. Bring healing to her mortal body and strength to her soul. We pray for Eva Reed, who is going to see a cardiologist and needs to make a, a decision about a procedure. We just ask that you would guide her, that you would help her to choose well, that you would give her your peace that passes understanding. We pray for a man named Mike who's suffering from anxiety and depression. And he's, not, he's probably not the only one. We pray for everyone here who's suffering with those things. We ask that the, your, your Messiah and your spirit, who is a wonderful counselor, would work in their lives. And finally, we lift up to you today other things we have not written on cards. But you know the, the burdens of our heart, the, the pain that is in some of our souls, all of our souls. You know the concerns we carry for others. We lift these things up to you now and we ask that you would answer our prayers, not only according to what we have asked for, sometimes we don't know what to ask for, but according to your wisdom and your power and your love, which is greater than all we ask for. And these things we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to release children to go back with Danell for Children's Church. We're also going to receive this morning's offering. And we're going to worship the Lord in song all at the same time. All at the same time. So y'all can bring your stuff up. So this next song we're going to do is one we've done here at the church for a while. But I think sometimes we miss what the songs are about. This song is about the extravagance of God's love. And I'm not sure that extravagance is the right word. So I'm going to just kind of explain it. When, it's okay to stand, or you can be seated either one. But uh, when, my, when my daughter was little, when she was a little baby, I loved her so much that I used to sit by the, her crib and watch her sleep because I was just in such awe that God had blessed me with something that precious. And as she got older, I mean, still the sweet age, you know, like two and three years old, uh, I was praying for her one day, and uh, it was one morning, and God said, you know I love her more than you do, right? And I was like, Well, first it was like, no way, because, I mean, I like really love her. But then I was realizing, wow, that's exactly right. That's exactly how God is. That's, that's an example of how big he loves. Back in the Old Testament days, the, uh, the Israelites, when they were leaving, you guys know these stories. The Israelites were leaving Egypt. They didn't have no water, so what did God give them? Gave them water. From a rock, right? Gave them got water from a rock. Gave them manna and quail and all that stuff. Which is really cool too. I mean, because that's a loving father right there. Never let you not have the necessities that you need. But in Psalm 81, God talks about the Israelites and how they would just kind of uh, move away from him as far as following him. And he, he told him, if you just follow my commandments, if you just be my people, I'd give you even greater fare than... This is the Mike Turner version. I'd even give you more than water from a rock or manna or quail. I'd give you honey from a rock. 
That's extravagant love. And that's, that's what God just offers us all the time. So this song is called Honey, Honey in the Rock. It's honey in the rock, water in the stone, metal on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know. Everything I need you got is honey in the rock. God's people said, Amen. Amen. And if you would now remain standing, we're going to do something that probably no church in North America has done today. We're going to follow singing Honey in the Rock by reciting the historic affirmation of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I don't know if any other church has ever done this, but let's do it now. <laughs> and from our hearts, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated now. And at this time, um, you know, we, ha we have announcements and we have to limit the number of announcements every service, but we had a last minute announcement. And so, so Justin Spencer has paid $500 to give this announcement at both worship services. <laughs> only I, I jokingly said it costs, you only get 45 seconds. Talk slower this time so they can hear you. The pumpkin patch announcement was not, was not pre-approved, and so you owe me an extra $5. <laughs> and the uh, microphone is still working this time, but you know, actually, pastors, uh, there are two people we don't want to mess up with in the church, mess with in the church. One is the pianist, especially if she or he is the only accompanist, and the other is the tech guy, because yeah, uh, they could turn the so sound off just like that, right? <laughs> not that you would. Um, by the way, I want to remind you that, that next week um, I'm going to be sharing um, something of the spiritual vision for Northwest Hills going forward and a, a lot of stuff about um, what we're going to try to do to help that to happen and also some pragmatics about what it is to kind of try to move forward because um, I, I'll just say that, that sometimes getting everybody to march together, you know those boring parts of the Old Testament when they're describing all the, the tribes marching together before they got the honey in the rock or whatever like that, and they're in the wilderness for 40 years, and they're talking about how they all lined up. I think those parts of the Bible are in there for a reason, because uh, we're not as numerous as the Israelites, but getting us all to be on the same page and walk somewhat in the same direction, that's a work that all of us have to do together. So anyway, that's next week, a message on, on vision. Anyway, let me get going for today. A few weeks ago, on a Sunday afternoon, yes, it was on a Sunday afternoon, after church, of course, I was studiously being righteous and obeying the fourth of the Ten Commandments, the one about resting on the Sabbath. And I was obeying the Lord by reclining in my recliner, and exercising the, the spiritual gift. And by the way, God uses men and women alike, but here's one place where men are superior. We more often have the spiritual gift of intermittent napping. It is a gift. We just exercise it. While I was exercising that gift when the doorbell rang, and my wife Linda, who does not have the gift of napping, or at least she does not exercise it as often as I do, do she went and answered the door, and there was a father and a son there who wanted to know if they could mow our lawn for $40. And that was a reasonable offer for them to make, and if they picked our house out, it would make sense, because the thing is, when Linda and I and Linda's mother Susan moved to San Antonio, my 12-year-old push mower was injured in the trip, and so rather than send it to the lawnmower surgeon, I purchased a new lawnmower. 
I then got the, the ethanol-free gasoline I was told I should use with it. Yes, indeed. Yes. Yeah, Jason was there when I bought it. And so I had this new lawnmower. Well, Linda asked me if we wanted to pay the father and son to mow our lawn. I said, no, uh, tell them we've purchased a new lawnmower and I'm going to use it soon. And then Linda, who has this fault, it's maybe related to not napping that much, but she, she really thinks about me. She really cares about me. And so she was thinking, maybe I'm too tired, as if I would be the one who would be too tired and not her. But she said, maybe you're sure you don't want them to mow the lawn. And so I said to her, words to the effect, at least in my own mind, she can correct me to you if I was wrong, but I said, while I greatly appreciate the concern, I genuinely want to play with the new lawnmower. <laughs> so I waited for the sun to go down because I didn't want to pr play with harmful UV rays. And about 7.15 or 7.30 p.m., I went out and I mowed the lawn. And that raises a question for this morning. When I was mowing the lawn on a Sunday evening, was I, in fact, working and not resting on the Sabbath? And if I wanted to muddy the waters, I could raise the very real question of when does the Sabbath begin and end? Is it at sunrise or sunset? Because when people get serious about this, they don't always agree. But for my more honest answer would be, actually, my calling is to work on the Sabbath, I think I have an exception there. If I'm not here, I, I don't think, you, I think you would notice, I don't think God would be pleased, so I need to rest on another day. But in this case, mowing the lawn was a form of resting for me because a lot of my work is in my head and mowing the lawn is mentally relaxing. I'm walking along as if I have a walker, by the way. Not that I've ever thought about that. I'm walking along as if I have a walker and, and, and I'm just playing with my new toy like a little boy on Christmas morning. All of which, by the way, you know, sometimes you have to wonder where that line is between rest and play and work. After all, when they used to tell children, you can't play because it's the Lord's day, it's the Sabbath, so sit on the couch, that was work for them. So how that line works, I don't know. And mowing the lawn, it can be work, but some days it can be like going for a walk and, and a cross between going for a walk and coloring a picture in a coloring book. And when you're done, you feel better than if you've taken a nap or NFL season is coming. You feel better if you mow the lawn sometimes on a Sunday than if you try to watch a third football game because one football game is a blessing if your team wins, two makes you feel happier, but three after a while it gets to be too much. Anyway, for the past eight weeks, I, I've been preaching messages on what I believe are the most important questions in the world. Who is Jesus? Why does he matter? And what does it really mean for us to follow him? Well, today I want to share a message on a secondary topic a topic which is not one of the most important things in the world, but rather a topic which is a sub-part of one of the most important things of the world. A topic that is one part of following Jesus on the road that leads to eternal life. And the topic or subtopic I speak of is work. Just regular work. Hey, it's Labor Day. Regular work. And is regular work good or is it evil? And why do we have to work? And since apparently we do have to work, how do we get work right as a Christian? So would you pray with me? And then on this Labor Day, I'm going to share some practical and spiritual truth about the Bible and what it means that all of us in some way have labors to perform. Heavenly Father, work is a part of life. And sometimes we like it and sometimes we don't. Help us this morning to see this part of life in the light of your truth, in the light of your kingdom. Help us to see it that way so that when we're walking with you, we can walk a little more closely on the other days of the week. This we ask in Jesus' name.
So first, in the way of a general overview, let's look at what the Bible has to say about work. Is it good? Is it evil? Is it necessary? And if you have forgotten, or if you've never really noticed this, the Bible does say that we are created to, among other things, work. And you don't have to read far in the Bible to find that truth. No, in the beginning, in Genesis 1, we are told that as God was creating the heavens and the earth, that then God at a certain point said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Don't forget both male and female made in the image of God. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. So if you read Genesis 1 and you let it speak to you in its own terms, Genesis 1 is not about repudiating science or insisting that the earth has to only be a few thousand years old or best of all that there were dinosaurs on the ark. No, Genesis 1 is telling us who God is and what he did as we relate to him. God is the one who created everything. And that God created everything so that it has a purpose and a place. The sun and the moon are in the heavens as God created it to be and they give us light. The birds and the fish are in the sky and the sea and they exist there as God intended them to. And there are all kinds of creatures that move along the ground, the surface of the earth, as if the earth was created for these creatures, but not only for these creatures. And finally, God created us in his likeness, in his image, to rule over and have dominion over this planet. It's not about a timeline. It's about a reason. And at first, reading Genesis 1, you might be struck by the truth that we alone are said to be made in the image of God, or we are made in the image of God in the way that nothing else in creation was made in the image of God. And then you might notice that we're supposed to be in charge. Oh boy! That always sounds like fun until you are in charge, by the way. And that leads me to the something you might not see to your second or third or fourth reading of Genesis 1. And that is ruling over or superintending over a planet is work. You're in charge. Hey, yeah, that's great. It is being in charge of land and animals work? Just ask a farmer who's only in charge of a few dozen or a few hundred acres, and they will tell you, oh my, it is work, and thank God for John Deere, too. <laughs> and work is not a curse. It is part of a world that God originally called not good, but pretty good. Or, did I get that wrong? No, he, he, he didn't call it after six days. He didn't call it good, but what did he call it? Very good. And so work is part of a world that God called very good. So work was created to be a blessed thing. And we are created to work, but beyond that, we are also commanded to work. We don't always know what's good for us. And if you ask, where are we commanded to work? Well, if you've never really noticed, in the book of Exodus, there's, there's this little side character. He's not very important. His name is Moses, and God gave him ten suggestions about how we should live our lives. Or, you know, did I get that wrong too? No, uh, they weren't suggestions, they were orders, they were directives, they were commands, they were commandments, yes. And one of those commandments said, by the way, Charlton Heston made a movie about this, really good if you've never seen it, but he said, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. 
On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore God blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. In the sense of being spiritual, but also separate and different. So when we're talking about that verse, we most often have our thoughts drawn to, you know, the one day, the Sabbath. It is a holy day. It is a day that is set apart. It is a day that is set apart for rest and for worship and for God. But did you notice mention is made of the other six days? On them we are to labor and do all of our work. So that means just as rest is good and commanded, and unrelenting work without rest is presumably not good or healthy, well, work in its place is good too. And if we don't have work to do, we miss it. That is why parents say something that sounds absurd, but it's not. They will say, my children are ready to go back to school now. They want to go back to school. I mean, when summer hits, it's like the Alice Cooper anthem, which kind of revealed the state of his soul, even before it wasn't clear. School's out for the summer. School's out forever, which sounds like he's thinking of heaven. Well, when summer hits, it's like heaven has come down to earth. All the bad stuff is over. But by September, they are ready to go back to the work of school. That is also why people can really struggle when they retire. My in-laws told us um, decades ago when they lived in Vermont that a man in their church retired. His friends in the church threw him a big party. The very next day, you can fill in the blank, can't you? He fell over dead. And that could have been, probably was just a coincidence, but the way it happens, it makes you think, you know, work really is important to me. And what do I have when that's over? My mother grew up poor. She was the oldest of five children. And as the daughter, she probably had to do, you know, a lot more of the work than a, I don't know, maybe daughters often take responsibility at a younger age. She said for a time, her family needed to be on government assistance. She said that there were some Christmases where they would not have had a Christmas as a family if it wasn't for the church. I guess as the eldest daughter, she, she knew all that. She saw all that. She was um, working to pay her way through college and giving a quarter of what she made to her mother to pay for the other kids. But, you know, my mother taught me welfare I don't know how to say this. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't desirable as a long-term answer, even though they had been on the equivalent. And she didn't mean to say anything about the people who are on welfare, but she meant that it wasn't good to be there forever because to not have meaningful work to do that could, you could support yourself with, that was not a good thing. She knew. Somehow she and my dad gave us all work ethics. So we are created to work. We are commanded to work. So why is it that sometimes work feels like a drag? We don't go singing as we go into work on Monday morning. Just came across the lyrics of a song, an old one, another manic Monday, wish it were a Sunday. Why do we have songs like that? Why don't we feel more enthusiasm for work some days or some years? Well, as a Christian, I would say, due to what we call the fall, and by the fall, Christians do not mean October when the temperatures go down in San Antonio, which I believe will be a good thing. They're not talking about when you drink pumpkin spice coffee and when Northwest Hills sells pumpkins, but rather when we speak of the fall as Christians, we mean the time when sin entered our world and we were estranged from God leading to continual sin and the systemic effects and after effects of sin. Well, due to that fall, everything is messed up. Nothing is really exactly as it should be, including our work. So what does Genesis 3 say happened after sin? The work of the man would be made harder. Do you remember the verse? In the sweat of your brow, you will eat your bread. 
And there's something about the ground yielding thorns and thistles. And what did he say to the woman? Your labor in childbearing will be made worse too. I, I, I often think probably in the physical and in the psychological sense because carrying children is hard and bearing them into this world can be a cause for tears. And, and, and you can see again and again how what the Bible spoke of plays out in this world constantly. I mean, what do they say is the world's oldest profession? In the first service, they were too embarrassed to say it. Maybe you won't be. Hey, I, I kind of shamed you. A prostitution. We say prostitution is the world's oldest profession. Somehow I don't really think that's probably true. And if you read your Bible, there's a man named Nimrod who might make you think, well, right about the time they came up with prostitution, they came up with slave trading too because Nimrod was a hunter of men and they were building that tower. I mean, everything. Either way, it was bad. Of course, now we have computers and technology and machines. So it's all going to be better. Just don't watch Arnold Schwarzenegger's Terminator movies. It might make you see it differently. <laughs> By the way, if you think of the origins of Labor Day, not a strictly religious holiday, but there's something Christian about it. It was a holiday to, holiday to celebrate and humanize workers and working and the welfare of workers. It has been said, if not for the trade unions in America, we might have had a Marxist revolution as they had in other nations so disastrously. Anyway, the question maybe is, how much should you care about how we approach work? If we believe that work was meant to be a good thing, but it's all messed up due to human nature and sin, how much does it matter? Here's the thought I really want you to have. And if you remember this and you forget everything else, the sermon has been a success. We Christians are sometimes accused of being hypocrites. That happens when we say one thing and do another. Or that happens when we separate or compartmentalize our lives so that we say, here I have my religious life and over here I have everything else and I don't let the two of them touch. So I'm really two different people. So what is the answer? What is the cure for being a hypocrite? If you are a Christian, the goal is for Jesus Christ to be the Lord of every part of your life. Not that you'll be perfect. At times you might be gloriously inconsistent. You might need to laugh at yourself even when you haven't tried to do anything wrong. But that is the goal, the cure for hypocrisy, for Christ to be Lord of every part of your life. So just as it wouldn't be authentic for someone to say, I am a married woman, but I'm going to have an affair because I feel like it, or it wouldn't be authentic for someone to say, I am a, a Christian family man, but I beat my wife and I ignore my children. Well, well, your faith, our faith, needs to carry over not only to the way we re relate to our families, but to the way we do our work. It needs to relate to everything. There should be a line that connects the cross to the cashier's cash register, to the, I don't know, the teacher's classroom, to the construction worker's tools. All of it should be connected. Because being a Christian is about a total life lifestyle. Do you see that? Do you believe it? Do you try to live it out? I, I hope you do. So if you want Christ to be Lord of your whole life, including your work life, here are just three quick practical takeaways to take home with you about your work and about Jesus. Number one, remember, yes, remember, 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 work is normal and necessary. And I think for people today in this country, that sense for some folks has been decreasing. And then it's gotten weaker in recent years. All of us remember COVID-19. The pandemic was one big mess. And whether or not the government handled it correctly, that pandemic did a lot of damage to the country, 
and a lot of damage to a lot of different people. I remember early on, almost everything was shut down. Schools were closed. Businesses were closed. Churches were not allowed to meet. And we were told that unless your work was, what was the word? Essential. Stay home and the government can send you a check. And it didn't always sink in that this can't work for too long of a time. And whatever you think of the virus or the decisions that were made about how to handle it, I think the government was doing its best. But even if you think they got absolutely everything right, here's the problem that was still here with the lesson we came away with. Telling students, teaching students by your actions that going to school was not essential. Telling workers your job is not essential. Also telling churches your ministries are not essential. That was all bad. It was a bad message. I wish they could have said it in a different way because we need to remember that these things are normal and a necessary part of life that we neglect at our own peril. There is an Old Testament proverb that says a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. And that can be true even in a land of plenty if we forget what we are about. So when you think of work, if you have trouble remembering that it's important, think of Jesus. When Jesus spoke of the kingdom of God, he often compared it to work. He told stories about farming and fishing and mixing dough with yeast. And he, he did that because people understood these things and they were a part of life. Or remember Jesus, before he was a preaching Messiah, he was a carpenter. Or perhaps the Greek word technon is said to indicate one who would have been a stonemason in that day. But he worked with his hands, he worked with things, he worked building things. So work is normal. Work is necessary and Jesus modeled that and you could argue Jesus blessed that and if it wasn't holy before he did it was holy after he did it then number two the Bible says in the New Testament in a letter from Paul to the Corinthians whether you eat or drink do all to the glory of God so let me ask you can you do your jobs can you do your daily work even if it's not for money to the glory of God and if that's a new thought to you, it's not a new thought. 500 years ago, before the Protestant Reformation, when people spoke of having a calling, a vocation, a sort of special occupation that mattered, they often meant being in the church, being a priest, being a, a monk, being a nun. But Martin Luther said, you know what? There's a priesthood of all believers, and therefore all secular jobs and occupations were worthy of such respect. In the same way John Calvin taught that every Christian has a vocational calling to serve God in the world in every sphere of human existence, I would add every sphere that is legitimate and not sinful. Not out in things that are really bad, but if you work a job that is honorable, it is a calling in a sense. John Wesley even drew a line between work and making money and God. He famously said in one of his sermons, gain all you can, make all the money you can, just like Ebenezer Scrooge, and then save all you can, save all the money you can, just like Ebenezer Scrooge, and then what do you, what's the third thing? Give all you can, just like Ebenezer Scrooge got it right at the end. So based on that, can I share with you a thought about how important your job is or how important your job will be or how important everybody else's job is? A long time ago, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, I was attending junior college <laughs> to work my way through and get a four-year degree and then go to seminary so I could be here. And I had a professor in junior college who was not a Christian at all. But once he said the most humble and Christ-like thing, he said that society needed the men who took our garbage away more than they needed college professors like himself. That stayed with me. I honestly don't know when you think about all that we get through learning today. I don't know what's harder to replace, the professors or the trash men. But when you picture your trash building up and building up and no one taking it away and the rats gathering and spreading disease, well, thank God for the men who take our trash away. 
I mean, you can argue that college costs too much, but uh, we would pay more to have our trash taken away. Well, come to think of it, the company that hauls our trash away, it's run by women, so thank God for them, too. And finally, number three, can you try to see your job, your work, what you do with your life, in, in all the things you do now, from the perspective of heaven and eternity? And I know we can only do that so well, but if this is a new thought for you, there's a prophecy in Isaiah about God's end game. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And then this is the part that people often think of because of how terrible war is. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. They will turn, in other words, their weapons of war into farm equipment. And nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. And I know Jesus said, no eye has seen or ear has heard what God has prepared for those who love him. Our, our pictures of, of heaven now are very vague. And Isaiah's words may be best understood as telling us true things about God's kingdom, not as it probably literally would be if we were filming it on YouTube, but he was using words we can understand to make us understand what it will be like. But that said, when we hear the promises of God in Isaiah about beating swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, and we think no more war, that's a valid thought. That would be a blessing. No more war. No more young men or women coming home in boxes. No more Russia and Ukraine doing what they're doing now. But there's another question. If that is what heaven will be like or the kingdom of God on earth, what will those plowshares and pruning hooks be for? We were created to mean something and to do things that matter in this life and I suppose in the next. So I pray for you that when it lasts, and I do pray that you will make it there, you come into God's kingdom and you are doing whatever it is that God has prepared for you to do in eternity. You might sometimes pause and say, you know, maybe it doesn't matter anymore, but it's strange. This stuff I'm doing now, it reminds me a little bit of some of the stuff I used to do back on earth. And I guess maybe that mattered too. You matter. What you do for God matters. Everything you do matters. It counts. So, so would you pray with me? For what we do at work and at school and in all of life. Oh God, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that life begins now. And it's lived out in church, but it's not only lived out in church, you would have it be lived out everywhere. So please help us as we study, as we work, as we drive, as we lift things, as we type into computers, as we talk to people, as we cook, as we know as we do as we sell things and buy things help us to honor you and do all to your glory that in ways small and occasionally big what we do will be very good this we ask in Jesus name We're going to prepare to take communion now. And so as is our habit for all of two months, <laughs> as I'm very new, we're going to join in saying and praying together 
the great thanksgiving. And so I ask that you would listen. And when you see it's not bright yellow because that didn't show well on the screen. Justin does good work back there. When you see words that are in amber, if you would read them aloud. And if you would read them from your hearts as an act of worship. And so the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me when the supper was over he took the cup gave thanks to you gave it to his disciples and said drink from this all of you this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me and so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As our communion stewards come forward, let me simply remind you again, as stated, that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said that this was his body that was to be broken for us. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he explained that this was his blood which is to be shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. In the Methodist tradition, we practice open communion. That means we do not exclude people based on the church they are a member of or the denomination they are a part of or anything of that nature. We simply ask that you would examine your souls and if you are a follower of Jesus or would like to be and are seeking him, then we invite you and we urge you to come and partake. And we mean that so much that even for those of you who are, have a problem with gluten, which is a real thing, over at that table we have communion for those of you who cannot tolerate gluten. So if the stewards would come forward now.
Father, thank you for the opportunity to come together as a family here and receive communion. God, as we, ta as we take the 
the juice and the bread beckon for us to become the body and blood of Christ. And in that remembrance, help us reflect on ourselves and our relationship with you. And to make us more of who you want us to be. We love you, Father, and we pray this in the holy, holy, holy name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. amen. God is good in all the time. If they can move the mountains, let the mountains move. We come with expectation, waiting here for you.
Amen. Would you join me now in the sending forth? All need to be saved. All can be saved. All can know they are saved. And all can be saved to the uttermost. 